also with Logic Forte. We're one of the sponsors for today's event. Um, super excited to be here, super excited to support the event. Uh, we're longtime Laravel users, uh, so I, um, I'm glad to have the opportunity to introduce uh, Taylor Otwell from Laravel. Um, he's actually the creator of Laravel. Um, how many of you are familiar with Laravel? Awesome, awesome. Well, for those of you who are not, uh, Laravel is a, a PHP framework that can really simplify uh, the pr uh, process of building up PHP apps. Uh, we, uh, Taylor created Laravel in 2011, and uh, our company moved to Laravel in 2016, so not necessarily early adopters, but um, pretty familiar with everything that he's done, and um, it's definitely made our lives a lot easier. Uh, if you do work with PHP, we've been able to use Laravel to um, um, really take a lot of legacy code and, and modernize it. Um, we're out on AWS now, and, and Laravel was a huge key to the success of moving out to AWS. So um, with that, uh, today's talk, um, uh, Tyler is going to be talking about um, well, uh, <coughs> Laravel Vapor, which is the serverless framework uh, that, um, that, they, that he's built that allows you to run your Laravel applications on serverless platforms like AWS Lambda, and he'll give a little bit of background about what serverless is all about and how you can get into that space. But with that, I'll hand it off to Taylor. Thank you. All right, so uh, thanks for having me. Like you said, I'm Taylor Otwell. I uh, am the founder and creator of Laravel which, as you said, is a full-stack PHP framework uh, for sort of rapidly building web applications or backends for mobile applications or backends for even video games or whatever. Um, I grew up in Hot Springs, Arkansas, so about four hours from here. Uh, went to college in Arkansas and then worked at um, Arkansas Best Freight in Fort Smith, where I did a lot of COBOL and .NET, and eventually moved into the PHP world. Um, so I'm going to kind of give you some backstory on Laravel. Uh, back in 2010, I was, like I said, I was doing a lot of COBOL, a lot of .NET, and kind of this enterprise company. And um, at night, I would stay up late, like after my wife went to bed, and just like hack on side project ideas, like business ideas, just like little hobby projects that I had in mind. And I really wanted like a fast way to prototype those ideas. And doing that in .NET was, I mean, complicated at the time. You know, the hosting is more complicated. It costs more money. And I really wanted like a fast PHP framework to prototype these ideas. And so I sort of got sucked into working on this thing I was calling Laravel. And I worked on it for like six or eight months, like I said, like late into the night. And uh, eventually put it out on GitHub in June or July of 2011. And put a little website up and some documentation. And the first day, I got four likes on GitHub. And it was like the best day of my life. Um, it, was, it felt really cool to put something out there and just like have anyone care about it at all. Uh, but anyway, it sort of like, uh, it sort of started gaining some traction. It wasn't like this hockey stick growth curve uh, in Laravel, but you know, it, it was, had some momentum and it was slowly growing. And um, about six months later, at the very end of 2011, this guy emails me out of the blue, actually while I'm at work. <laughs> and he's like, hey, uh, I saw Laravel, it looks cool. We build help desk software on PHP. We want to rewrite all our stuff to use Laravel. Are you interested in working for us? Um, and so I, I said, OK. And I was going to work remotely, even though they were based in New York. And that was my first full-time PHP job, even though I had this PHP framework that was sort of gaining uh, momentum. Um, so I worked there for a few years, like 2012, 2013, 2014. And in 2015, January 1st, 2015, actually, I went full-time on Laravel. Uh, and I did that because I launched a business built around Laravel called Laravel Forge. Um, so it is a server provisioning service for people that are building Laravel apps. Like you build your app and now you need to get it like out onto the internet, like into production. Um, this lets you link like your AWS account or your DigitalOcean account and then builds the server for you, installs PHP, installs MySQL, installs Redis, and uh, you're good to go. Like you can get push and it deploys, blah, blah, blah. So this started getting customers. And like within a few months, I was making more money off this than I was in my regular job. So I was like, I'm done with that, and just started working uh, on Laravel full time. And uh, since then, you know, I did it myself for a few years, and we've hired a few staff members. I have three team members now. Um, Mohammed in Egypt was my first, uh, the first person I brought on board, and then Dries in Belgium, and a guy named James that lives in the UK. 
And so we've just been you know, chugging along ever since. We've launched a few other products, Laravel Vapor, which I'll show some today, Laravel Envoyer, Laravel Nova, and then a bunch of like free open source tools as well. Um, so it's kind of a quick rundown of my history with Laravel. Um, you can, of course, go to laravel.com and check out the documentation and, and stuff like that. So he said, he asked how many people were familiar with Laravel, and a lot of people raised their hand. How many people actually like use Laravel for real, like in production? Okay, a pretty decent number, actually. Um, so giving a talk like this at a conference like this is always a little challenging because um, some people have used it, so it's like you can't keep it too basic or it's boring. Some people haven't used it, so if I go too advanced, it's like too much. So I'm kind of kind of I'm going to start with like a rundown of Laravel, some of the key highlights, some basic stuff, and then some like more advanced stuff, just to kind of like give you a taste of what Laravel looks like and what it feels like to use. And so that'll be kind of like the first half of the talk, and then we'll look at pushing that out onto like a serverless platform like Vapor, and we can all play with it. I built kind of like a real-time chat page that we can use to test it out. All right, so um, I don't really do any slides in any of my talks at any conferences. I just do like uh, some live coding. So I've got this file that we'll kind of work down through to look at some examples. And um, so briefly, Laravel is a full stack framework for PHP. So have you? ever use Ruby on Rails or like Django for Python or whatever, this is gonna feel similar. It's gonna have a lot of the same features. So things like how do we route requests to like controllers or callbacks or how do we get stuff from the database? How do we authenticate people? All that stuff is sort of built in, batteries included, so to speak. And uh, to sort of give any one person the ability to build their own app, because remember that's sort of like the whole backstory for Laravel is it was a way for me personally uh, and no one else to build out these prototype ideas. So it's very much geared towards like one person being able to sit down at night hacking on a side project and churn out like a full app. Um, so before we dig into this file, I wanna show you how a PHP framework actually works. So you might think like, oh, building a PHP framework, that sounds pretty complicated, but it's actually a pretty simple concept. So this is a Laravel app and all PHP frameworks, no matter which one it is, work basically the same way. And how they work is you tell your web server anytime a web request comes in to run this file, like a single file. And that's almost always a file called like index.php, which is what it is here in Laravel. Um, and this script just runs top to bottom. Like when, when it's done, that request is over, it's sent back to the browser, whatever it output, and the HTML or whatever, and that's displayed on the screen. So how this actually works is when your web server invokes PHP, it passes along like this big array of server or environment variables. And I'm just gonna dump that out here so we can look at it. So I've hit method.test here. Um, that's me kind of dumping out everything. And if I kind of dig through here, you can see like it gives you the host, like the domain of the request, um, the request URI, in this case it was just a slash, but like say I went to like foo slash bar and I look at that request, uh, request URI. Where'd it go? Foo. Yeah, the request URI is gonna be like the path section or like the query string. All of the headers are in here with like HTTP underscore accept, HTTP underscore user agent. Those are all the headers from the request. Every PHP framework, this is what you have to work with when it first like boots up. And from here, it's up to the framework to kind of translate that into these user-friendly like request objects, response objects, blah, blah, blah. But it all boils down to this. And so that's, that's how Laravel works. Um, this script is invoked. We build out, we bootstrap the framework. We capture the HTTP request, which turns all that nasty like environment variable stuff into this nice object that represents the request where you can like access the query string, access the headers. And then we uh, send it through the framework, through the framework kernel. We send out the HTTP response and then we like terminate the application, that's it. So it's actually like, it feels pretty magical when you're deep into it and using it, but it's actually a really simple concept and how these things work. All right, so back to this routes file. So how Laravel works is it will receive that request and then look through this list of routes which match like URL patterns and then call the function that's associated with that route. So like. Right here, the slash, this is sort of like the home route, no other uh, path parameters. And when I call that um, method.test, we just get hello world. You know, it just, it just invokes that function and whatever I return is sent back to the browser. Okay, so I mean, more 
for something more useful, um, we probably re want to return like a template of HTML. You know, we're not just going to return strings right here from these callbacks. So Laravel calls these views. Um, they're stored in a resources views directory, and they correspond like right here with the file name. So here I'm returning the welcome view. That's just going to return this template, the welcome.blade.php. Uh, Laravel's templating engine is called Blade. Like I said, I did .NET before this. .NET has a thing called Razor. This name is like a play on that because a lot of it is inspired by Razor. So it's going to return this. We can like pass variables to it, as you might expect, display them, loop through data, whatever we want to do. All right, so in this case, I'm like returning this uh, template. I'm passing a name variable to it that has Taylor. And then within the template, we can just echo that out right here. So the echoes look a lot like if you're echoing something in like Vue.js or whatever else. All right, so if I call that route uh, view, hello, Taylor. OK, great. Um, again, that's a very basic example. In a real world, we're probably going to want like most web apps have like a layout, you know, so to speak, where every page has like a top nav bar, a sidebar, and then like this main content area. So Laravel, of course, lets you do that. So here I'm returning like a user profile view. And um, if I look at this, you can see that this is extending a layout called layouts.simple. And then I can like inject content into the main content area of the layout. And so what that layout looks like is it's, again, just like a template. And then I can just yield the content wherever I want it to appear, like on the page. And all of my other like top nav or side nav that's persistent across pages can go in this file. All right, so if I hit that route, uh, slash profile, let's see. You can see it renders our layout and um, injects our content into the main content area. All right, so that's kind of the basic view templating functionality in Laravel. Um, how do we interact with the database? And of course, this is like a big part of building web applications. Um, Laravel has a few different ways to interact with the database. It has an ORM called Eloquent, which is a very active record style ORM. If you've ever used active record in Rails, um, this will feel really familiar. You can also just issue like raw database queries um, straight to the database uh, pretty easily. Um, so I'll, I'll show you a few examples of that. This is an example of just like a raw query. We can just say DB select, select star from users, you know, a really simple query, and just, we can just return that straight from the route. And so what happens is like anytime you return a collection or like an array from a route, it automatically converts that to JSON. So that makes it really convenient for building like JSON backends for a mobile app or an API or whatever else. Um, of course, this isn't like super great because I'm returning like the password hashes, um, some secret tokens here. So we don't really want to do that. Um, the ORM kind of helps you take care of some of that stuff. So I'm going to comment that out. And an active record ORM, what it means is like you have, a, you have a class, a PHP class that corresponds to a table. And active record ORMs usually use like a bunch of conventions to determine what the table name is. So like the plural name of the class is considered to be the table. So you'll have a user's table, and then like it assumes you have an ID column. And you can override all of these sort of conventions, but this is sort of the convention over configuration approach, you know, that Rails popularized where to help you get started quickly and then you can override and customize it if you need to. All right, so I have like a user class here in the app directory. And um, you can see it has like this hidden property that says hide the password and the remember token. And it has a few other things that we don't really care about right now. But now if I hit this route, we should basically get the same results, but you can see like it filtered out the passwords, it filtered out those tokens. And uh, it's sort of an object-oriented API for interacting with the database, so you don't have to write raw SQL or as little as possible. All right, um, most of the time we're going to want to like, we're not going to have these hard-coded URLs for every route, right? We're going to have to pass in like a user ID in the route or like a post ID or an order ID um, so that if you go to like order slash one, it pulls up the page for that order. So Laravel lets you have... Um, route parameters, these are sort of like wild cards, and they're passed into your route, whatever the value was in the URL. And then you can use that to interact, pull data from the database or do whatever you need to do. So in this case, I'm going to use the ORM again. I'm going to say find or fail. What this means is look up a user by this ID, but if you don't find it, throw an exception so that a not found 404 page will be displayed. Um, so to throw like a not found HTTP exception. 
So I already have some users in the database, so I should be able to hit like, for example, right here I have user one. So if I go to users one, you can see it automatically pulled that and it displayed it. If I go to users two, you get that. But then if I go to like 50, which doesn't exist, you can see I just get 404 not found automatically. Um, so a lot of convenient features like that are sort of built into Laravel. Again, a lot of it was because, you know, I built this to be very rapid for a person to use and to, and to spike something out. Um, I'm going to comment out this route. Uncomment this. And I want to show you another approach. So this is basically the same URL, user slash wildcard. But I've done something different here in the route where instead of just like getting a string, I tell the application that I want to receive like a whole user object that corresponds to this route parameter. And so again, this uses conventions to say, okay, he's asking for an app user object. I have a user parameter right here. So probably, you know, they want the user that corresponds with the ID in that portion of the URL to be injected in automatically. And so that's all going to happen for me. And if it doesn't find a user, again, it throws the 404 page. So we should basically get the same results here. If I hit users uh, one, you can see that um, it selected the user for that ID, and then I called that touch method to update the updated at timestamp on the user, and then it returned the user. Um, so that's called route model binding in Laravel. I think a pretty, a pretty handy feature that again was inspired by um, ASP.NET. And then a, a more advanced example of that, sometimes you might have like a nested route parameter where I want to inject the user and then I want to get a post from the user by the post title, like a post slug, maybe like a blog slug or something, and inject them both. But I want the post to be scoped to that user. So um, if I go to user slash one slash post slash some other person's blog title, uh, post title, I don't want to inject that post. Like, you, you know what I'm saying? Like it needs to be scoped so that post belongs to that user. So. Again, Laravel sort of detects this when you're asking for a user and a post or a user in any other model and says, okay, this, since this is um, not a unique ID, they probably want to scope this by the parent parameter. And so if I hit this route, let me see, what, what post titles do I have in the database? So I've got one title. This is like randomly generated data called UT. Uh, so if I hit that slash post slash that, you can see it. You can see the queries here. Select from posts where the user ID equals my user ID, um, and the title is this. Um, so it kind of automatically scoped the queries for us, and we know that we're dealing with like valid models. All right, and then Eloquent lets you do some other more advanced queries. Like um, we can kind of dig into the relationships even. So we can say, I want to get all the users that have blog posts where the title equals that and where their ID is less than 10, and then get. Give me everything that matches that. So Eloquent lets you do some pretty advanced stuff, um, queries that is pretty powerful. Um, so you can see it automatically writes like where exists, select from post, where it has that title, and then returns the users that have posts that match that title. Um, so it makes it pretty easy to sort of interact with your data in this object-oriented way and get what you need out of the database. All right, then creating a user. To create a user, we just would like new up an eloquent model, set some properties on it, and then call save. It would automatically write the insert statement, set the created at and updated at timestamps, and uh, we're pretty much good to go. So if I hit that route, create user, you can see there's the insert. Oops. And if I go to my uh, database users table, I don't think I can zoom in on this, and then refresh. You can see there's the new user there in the database. All right, so creating, updating, retrieving models, pretty easy to do in Laravel. All right, so those are kind of some basic features. Um, I want to show you a couple more advanced features of Laravel. Uh, one is the queue stuff. Um, so in a lot of web applications, um, you want them to be fast, obviously, and, but some stuff that you need to do, like sending an email or like processing a video or processing a podcast, that takes time, you know, even if it takes like five or 10 seconds, you don't want your website just spinning for 10 seconds. That, you know, people are gonna leave and it's not gonna look good. So Laravel was really one of the first full stack frameworks to include this feature of queues baked right into the box. And 
It supports a bunch of different queue backends, so we can send queues to Redis, we can send them to just like a MySQL table, we can send them to Amazon SQS, but the syntax stays the same no matter which driver you're using. All right, so in this example, I'm gonna get a podcast that I've already put in the database, and we're gonna spin through and dispatch a thousand jobs onto the queue, and um, we'll take a look at what it looks like. So a queue job is just another class in Laravel, and they live in app, jobs, process, podcast. And every queue job has a handle method, which is, this is just where you do whatever logic you wanna do um, in the background. In this case, I'm going to say that um, one out of 100 jobs I want to fail just because I want to be able to demo what it looks like when a job fails. Otherwise, there's just going to um, write some information to the log file called like processing podcast. All right, so Laravel has a free tool called Laravel Horizon that lets you monitor your queue stuff. So if I go to method.test less horizon, which I've already installed it, let's see here. This is sort of like an open source free queue dashboard for Laravel that anyone can use and download in your Laravel projects. And it's a really handy tool if you're doing any kind of background processing because you can see like your jobs per minute, your jobs per hour, how many jobs are failing. You can go and look through all your completed jobs, your failed jobs, whatever else, different metrics. All right, so I'm gonna use this for this demo because it'll let us kind of dig into it a bit. All right, so to start it up, we use the Laravel command line, which is called Artisan and we just call Artisan Horizon. That will start it up, and then this should change here in a second. And you can see that it shows me like how many processes I'm running, so I had it configured to run 10 queue processes, so those are like listeners in the background. So I have 10 processes, like asking the queue, is there any job to do, is there any job to do, over and over and over, and as soon as one becomes available, they work on it in the background. Um, it can show you like the wait time for the queue, so this queue, there's nothing in it, so it just has a few seconds. Uh, but this is really handy because you can see like in production, you can come out here and see, oh, this queue has like a 30 second wait time. So that means any job we put on it on average is taking 30 seconds before it even starts processing. Um, so maybe we need to add more workers or you know, if it's a five minute wait time, definitely we need to add more workers. So it gives you some good information like that. All right, so let's go ahead and call this route and we'll push a thousand jobs onto the database. Remember, we would expect like maybe 10 of them to fail. Um, so we should see some new failed jobs out there as well. So if I call Q, all right, so those are Q. Let's go out to our log. So you can see all of those. Yep, this is all recent. So it like really churned through those super fast because I'm using Redis and um, that's a pretty fast backend. Um, if we come out to Horizon, we can see we had 1,000 jobs in the past hour. That's the 1,000 we just dispatched. And we had 13 failed jobs, about the number we would expect. Um, and if I go out here to failed jobs, I can kind of dig into that job. I can see like the exception, you know, the stack trace for what went wrong, um, the data that was passed to the job. And then I can also come back here and just retry it right here from Horizon. So if I click that little circle thing, and now if I come back into it, I can see like the recent retry. So I can say, okay, we did retry it and that retry was successful. It worked this time and um, we're good to go. All right, so that's kind of a really quick rundown of the background processing stuff in Laravel. And uh, related to that is a really cool feature, probably one of my favorite features in Laravel called event broadcasting. So event broadcasting is kind of Laravel's answer to building real-time applications using WebSockets and stuff like that. And how it works is Laravel can already have events on the back end. So this, this route is an example of that. So I can listen for any event, which an event is just a class. In this case, I'm calling it invoice created. And I can do something when that event is fired. Okay, so like basic like observer pattern type stuff. All right, so when I call this route, I'm gonna listen for invoice created. When I receive it, I'm just gonna die and dump uh, event received. And then down here, I'm gonna dispatch it. So when I call this route, we should see the event like fire and get received. So slash event, oops. All right, so event received. Okay, so that's, that's great. But when I built event broadcasting, I already had these events on the back end, but I was like, it'd be really cool if on my front end, like JavaScript application, either my view or React application, I could hear these events too, like using WebSockets, and use like the same names, get the same data, everything. So it'd be like this shared terminology across the front end and back end. And that's basically what event broadcasting lets you do in Laravel. So like I said, for this demo, I built like a little chat page, like a real-time chat 
And I have a message model, which is going to be like a single message in the chat. And if we look at that class, I've got a created hook here that says, when any of these models are created, dispatch an event called message created. And now remember, that event we just fired earlier, that was only on the back end. We hadn't told it to broadcast at the front end at all. So if I look at this message created event, I've marked this with an interface called should broadcast. And if I have should broadcast on the class, I have to return a channel that I want to broadcast on. In this case, I'm just returning a channel called chat. All right, and so by default, every message that's broadcast will be worked by the queue. So this is going to kind of tie in with that queue thing we saw earlier. And then on the front end, so what does it look like, look like to consume these messages? Um, if I go out to my templates here, I've got chat. Yeah, this message list. First, let me just show it to you in the browser so it makes sense. Let me turn off that um, DB listen thing. All right, so here's the chat input. I send a message. I'll start, let me start at my queue first too, sorry. All right, I send a message. It shows up on the screen, you know, and the page is not like refreshing. It's all real time and sort of injected in as they come in. All right, so what does that look like on the front end? We had that message created thing on the back end, but I'm using a tool called Laravel Echo. So Echo is like the front end piece to this. It's an NPM library that you install, like NPM install Laravel Echo. And it gives you this really nice interface for listening to this. So I'm using Alpine.js, which is written by a friend of mine named Caleb Porzio. It's sort of like a really slimmed down version of Vue.js that you don't have to write like a component for. It's just all like right here in the markup. So this X and it, this is Alpine.js stuff. Google that if you're interested in that. But when this piece of DOM like initiates, I'm going to use echo to say echo channel chat. Remember that corresponds with the channel chat back here on the back end. Listen on that channel and listen for a message created event. That corresponds with the class name, message created. And when we receive it, we receive any public properties on the PHP class are automatically like JSON serialized down to the front end. So this has a public message, which is like the string of the message that I just sent. We're just going to like unshift that or basically pre-pin that onto the messages array so it's at the top of the message list. That's really all there is to it on the uh, front end side. All right, so then when it comes in, we're just shifting them onto the array. All right, so that's how event broadcasting works. And later we'll kind of push this out onto AWS Lambda. We can all hit this and post messages and see like how it scales the queue workers and stuff. All right, so that is basically what I wanted to kind of highlight in Laravel just to kind of give you a preview if you've never seen it before of what it's like and maybe pique your interests and things you can do with it. And now I'll uh, kind of transition to some of the serverless stuff. Um, so what, first of all, what is serverless? That's a good place to start. Um, it's kind of this hype thing right now and people have sort of different ideas on what it is. Um, to me, why, why did I get interested in serverless? is um, two things. One is a JavaScript library called Now. Has anyone ever heard of Now? Okay, this is cool. Not many people have heard of this, it looks like. Um, I saw this, and I, would, I just thought it was really cool. So Now test. So in this directory, I just have an index.html file that's just like, you know, a hello world file, basically. And Now is this command line JavaScript tool that you just say Now, and it deploys it out to like a serverless platform and puts a URL in your clipboard, you can see like right here. And now if I hit the URL, like it's deployed. And I, when I first saw this, I was like, that is freaking sick. Like to be able to deploy an app out there just using like one command and it's like auto scaling and they have a CDN in front of it. And I was like, I really want something like that for PHP. Um, because remember, I showed you earlier, I had built Laravel Forge which is manages servers for you, and we're managing almost 300,000 servers now. And so like I had felt the pain of managing servers. Like I've been down that road. Um, and I just didn't want to think about servers anymore, you know, at all. I didn't want to think about scaling them. I didn't want to think about operating system updates. I didn't want to think about SSL certificate renewals, any of that. And so I was just, when I saw this, I was like, that is cool, and I'm going to try to build that for PHP. And uh, that's basically what Laravel Vapor is, which is like the most recent thing I've launched. Um, 
And so what is serverless to me? Serverless is just allowing you to focus on your application and then you ship it out to some cloud like AWS or Microsoft and let them automatically scale it, let them automatically deal with all of that. And you don't think about servers at all. And I feel like there's our, we've done serverless stuff for like a while kind of. Have you ever uploaded a file to S3? I mean, that's basically serverless file storage. Have you ever used Heroku? That was sort of like the OG serverless to me, but the difference between something like Heroku and a serverless platform like Vapor is you don't have to sort of pre-guess the, so the capacity of your application because like, you know, I've had a friend, they launched an app on uh, a PHP app and then they got shouted out on Good Morning America and the app crashed because, you know, so many people are hitting it because they're on Good Morning America. And, you know, because you have to guess up front, like, how much RAM does my server need? How much CPU power does my server need? And sometimes, like, weird stuff happens, you know, and your server goes down because you're on some TV show. Um, <laughs> so the difference with serverless is you don't do any of that guessing up front. You're just billed in very small increments as you use the service. So on Amazon, they bill you in 100 millisecond increments. So every 100 milliseconds of CPU time your application uses, you're billed and you're billed based on how much, like how, how fast you want your application to run basically, is what they're asking you. How much RAM do you want to allocate to the application? They scale CPU proportionally and then they bill you in 100 millisecond increments. So if you're not getting any traffic at all, you're actually paying nothing on AWS Lambda um, because you're not consuming any of that time. And then if you get a huge spike of traffic, that's fine. They like automatically scale it up, um, you know, to, it's a super high scale and they just bill you for the time you use. Um, so web applications and Laravel fit really well into this model because how things work in serverless is you put an application up on AWS Lambda and you tell it when an HTTP request comes in, invoke this file. Um, so that sounds really familiar, right? Remember at the very beginning of the presentation, I said that every PHP framework works by telling the web server to invoke a single script anytime a web request comes in. So surprisingly, this old crufty language like PHP is like already sort of geared for this scenario. Like we've been waiting our whole life for this basically. Um, so that's exactly what, how Vapor works. Like we put your application up on AWS Lambda, we tell it to invoke this file, this PHP file, which we kind of like slide in front of your application. And it works the exact same way. Like if I dig into the Vapor code, Here's where we intercept things before we call your application. I just get this JSON blob from AWS that has all the same stuff, the path, uh, the headers are in here, the query string, and I just backfill in all those nasty environment variables we saw at the beginning of the presentation, and then we fire off your app and it doesn't even know the difference. It doesn't know that it's running on Lambda because all the environment variables are the same that it's used to on any traditional web server. Um, so it all works really well. Um, so let's go ahead and I'll pull up Vapor and kind of show you what it looks like and then we'll push this out to Vapor. Um, so if I go ahead and sign in, how this works is you link your own AWS account to Laravel Vapor. So uh, we don't, you know, we don't, it's kind of nice because you get to keep all your infra own infrastructure on your own account. We don't like hide it behind our own accounts. Um, so if I log in, I've got a project, a few projects out here. Uh, method, this is the one that's going to be this project. Um, you can have environments, like I have a production and a staging environment, of course, because like you're going to deploy stuff out to staging so your own devs can test stuff out. And then when you're ready to ship it live, you can ship it to the production environment. Each environment, just like we saw with now.js, gets its own like vanity URL, you might say, where this, like, they're assigned this long URL that you can use to access the application before you've associated it with like a real domain, which you can do uh, when you're ready. And then we can come in here, we can see the recent deployments, which I've got these sick commit messages, uh, whip on every commit. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, you can dig into like the steps of the deployment and it does, getting a PHP application to run a Lambda is actually pretty involved. And that was another thing that was kind of frustrating before I built this is every serverless demo I ever looked at was just like this hello world demo. And it's like, I don't know if they never use databases or like they never do anything, but it just was really frustrating because it didn't feel like, I, I didn't know what I was supposed to do with that. So 
Vapor was me trying to make getting a PHP application on Lambda really easy and really just simple. Um, and it's, it only works with Laravel. It's very tailored to that environment. All right, um, you can come out and like view metrics about your application. So like I can see how many HTTP requests have I got in the last 24 hours or different time periods. How long are those taking? How many queue invocations have I had in the last 24 hours? How long are those taking? And then it's kind of cool, it estimates your cost on Lambda for that. So like, you know, for these thousand requests, it cost me about one penny um, in Lambda cost. Same thing over here. Then I can view like my HTTP request, um, how many am I getting? You can see right here at like 10 o'clock last night as I was working on this talk, um, after one of the organizers made me nervous about it, um, I was spiking out some more, more requests and uh, you can see how long they're taking. It's kind of all over the place right now. And, and some other stuff. Uh, we can create databases. Um, so you can create MySQL or Postgres databases, and AWS kind of has two different approaches to that. So you can create a fixed size database where you like actually pick how much RAM you want your database to have, or they have a uh, serverless database, which um, they will automatically scale, like the storage, the RAM, the CPU, as your database is being used. It's a little bit more expensive to go that way. Um, for this demo, I just did like a little fixed size database, you know, like the smallest one. All right, and so um, if, I, if I drill into that database, again, we can get some metrics on that. Um, you know, what's the max connections over the last 24 hours, which I've been the only person using it, so uh, pretty low on these charts. How much disk space is left? All right, so that's kind of the Vapor side. And so to connect it to a project, every Vapor project has a vapor.yaml. So I'm going back into my demo project here. I have a vapor.yaml. And this is where we define like how we want those environments to look. So under environments that have production and staging, we're only gonna focus on staging right now. Um, so to kind of walk through this, I have my memory. I picked you know, 2048, two gigs of RAM basically. And you'll notice there's no CPU setting. That's because AWS does this thing called proportional CPU allocation, where based on the amount of RAM you give your application, they just like assign a proportional amount of CPU power. Like, so if you have 512 megabytes of RAM, maybe they give you like one core of a CPU. And if you go up to a gig of RAM, they give you two cores. I don't know, I don't know how high it goes. I think it goes maybe up to three or four cores. Um, we have different memory allocations on our CLI and our web front end, because remember I said that costs are associated with the RAM in 100 millisecond increments. So we want our web to be fast, but like our queue back end, since it's already on the back end and like users aren't waiting on it necessarily, it can be a little slower because we'll save money that way. So I only have 512 megabytes of RAM as, um, allocated to the CLI side. Uh, that database that I created in Vapor to attach it to this project, I just put this name right here into my vapor.yaml right here. And what that does is uh, Laravel has a database config file, like in config slash database, where that's where you know, like your username, your password, your host for your database goes. When we put this in our Vapor YAML, it's gonna automatically inject like the password, the host, all of that stuff we need in production so we don't have to worry about it. It's like all auto configured, so to speak. Uh, we got a couple build steps. These are steps that run on my machine locally, like when I run Vapor Deploy. Composer is basically like, you know, PHP's NPM, uh, NPM install. Uh, we're gonna do some caching stuff. And these deploy steps, these run on the Lambda side. So we're gonna migrate our database and then seed our database. And these steps run right before your application is made live. So the step runs and then if that's successful, it's like flipping the live switch and people can actually access it. All right, and so then, um, let's see if there's anything else I wanna show here. So deploy it is really simple. We just do vapor deploy. Um, let me get out of here, method. So here I am, what's different here? Just me commenting some stuff. Um, I can just do vapor deploy. And so what this does is every Lambda application needs to be like zipped up, like the old days, like literally zipped up in a .zip file and uploaded to AWS. So when I run Vapor Deploy, it runs those build steps, zips up the application, and you can see right here, it's uploading it to AWS, there goes the zip file, and then like stuff starts churning. Uh, we copy over your assets to CloudFront, so it's on a CDN automatically. Um, and then we start sort of configuring the serverless environment on the AWS side. If you need S3 storage, we get that ready. Um, we 
you know, inject all that database stuff I was telling you about. So these steps run. There's the deployment hooks, like migrating the database. This is basically like that now step. It takes a little longer than now because we're doing a lot of stuff, like asset management, database management, cache backend management, deployment hooks. So it takes a little bit longer, but basically this is the equivalent uh, to the now deploy. And then there's the last step. So it's flipping it live right now. So there's no downtime during deployments. Um, it only flips the sort of live switch if everything succeeds, and then we get our URL, um, kind of like now. Uh, it's put in our clipboard, and then we can hit that in our browser, and there's the application that we were just demoing. Um, so like if I hit profile, you know, all the same stuff we already went through. Um, and so again, like if I go to chat, you'll notice in here, like if we go back to my vapor file there was no queue configuration i didn't specify any of that it's all sort of automatic um, because this is tailored for laravel we know like how the queue works we know how to configure it so vapor just does all that for you it creates a queue for the application and for the environment specifically and then you can just like i didn't have to change any of that dispatch code back here um, it all just works the same um, even though the back end is using amazon sqs now instead of redis and so we can try this out. Um, the queue should automatically scale to process any jobs that come in. This is a really long URL, so like for your convenience, I made method.laravel.com, which will redirect you. And uh, you can go out here. Um, if you have any questions about the presentation, you can just like fire them to me in here if you want, <laughs> if you want to be anonymous. Uh, but if we send a message, it should, um, it should work, basically. All right, so there's my message. So the first one is kind of slow, but you'll notice it like, gets faster as the queue is scaling automatically. All right, so we didn't have to configure anything, and we have this real-time backend queue processing, you know, WebSocket stuff going on a serverless environment. All right, so if, you ha if you're interested in Laravel and you've never used it, a really good place to start is to go to laracast.com which is run by my buddy Jeffrey, and there is a free course called Laravel 6 from scratch. Um, Laravel 7 is out now, but the changes are not significant, so this is still fine. Um, it even walks you through like how to install PHP on your computer, how to install MySQL, how to get Laravel going, all that stuff, all the way down through like authentication, forms, sending emails, sending notifications, like mobile notifications, SMS authorization. This is all totally free, so if you're interested in Laravel, that's a really great place to start, and there's a lot of other free series out here as well, um, so give that a go. All right, any other questions before I wrap up? Yeah, so really large. Um, the that's kind of the interesting thing about serverless is I feel like it works really good for small or large because on the small side, a lot of small websites are over-provisioned all the time. Like in my own stuff even, like Laravel.com is running on like a server with four gigs of RAM and we're only using like 10% of that all the time. So it's like all these wasted resources that cost more money. Whereas in serverless, since you're only paying for what you use, a lot of small sites actually save money because they're not over-provisioned all the time with extra RAM and extra CPU. But then on the large side, you have you know, the whole power of the AWS cloud. By default, they, start, they say that you can have 1,000 concurrent requests going at a time. So that's like the default limit. Now, you can have them raise that limit you know, by contacting their customer support and requesting like a service quota raise. But it, they'll scale super high. So some of the big companies using it I know are like, you know like the mobile vacuums, the iRobot vacuums or something like that? They use a ton of serverless stuff at really high scale. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other big examples of serverless. Um, but there's some super huge deployments out there running on Lambda. Now, on the large side, you're not, I wouldn't say you're saving money, you know what I mean? But you're saving a uh, headache in terms of managing that many servers at that scale. So you'd have to factor in like DevOps salaries to manage servers, you can get rid of all that. And uh, so, some people go serverless because they think, oh, I'm going to save money. But on the large side, I don't think that's necessarily the case. You're saving headache more than you're saving money. On the small side, I think you really are probably saving money. I don't know. Hopefully that answered that question. 
Anything else? People are always like while out on these chat, real-time chat <laughs> demos I do. All right, I'll be hanging around for a little while. Um, thanks for listening to the talk. Hopefully, if you'd like to check out Laravel, thanks for having me.